so so here's the hard part. Compared to God, we are all heretics. Without fail. Welcome to Kingdom Unleashed. Our mission, our passion is to revive the church and to unlock the fivefold. I'm speaking to Dr. Corne Becker in the second session of the interview. He is the Dean of the of Regent University School of Divinity. And he's a man who brings deep conviction by the Holy Spirit to one's life. Dr. Corne exposes the ultimate danger or problem in the church and reveals how we tend to exalt ourselves instead of exalting Christ. This is a profound session. So allow the Lord to shine his light on your heart for his glory. Enjoy. Thanks, Corne. So, yeah, I, I love also your backstory. I always love to hear somebody's backstory to get a feel of what molded them, what formed them. And I also believe it, it, it invites us into that same kind of surrender. And I, I love your journey of, of surrender. So, um, I want to ask you, um, in this session, we're going to talk about a few things like the biggest problem in the church and also about cancel culture and things in the church. But yeah, so let's let's kick it off. So what is the biggest problem in the church? That's a really, really difficult question. And thank you for leading off <laughs> with that one. Um, I think ultimately, ultimately, there, there are many different manifestations of this particular problem. And I think the ultimate danger in the church, the ultimate problem in the church is the question of choice. Who do we choose? I used to think for a very, very long time that the obvious choice in the world is between good and evil. The obvious choice is between that which is holy and that which is not. The longer that I have served Christ, the longer that I've lived, Andre, I've come to believe that the choice is a bit more subtle. The choice goes back really to the garden. It goes back to Genesis 3. And it's the question of what is the source of truth? When you look at the original temptation, um, so Adam and Eve are in the garden. God says, you can do pretty much anything. The only thing that you cannot do is to partake of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And let me just stop you for a moment. You look at that and you think, oh, what in the world is wrong with knowing the difference between good and evil? Is that not exactly what we are after? But the point is about the source of truth. And when you look very carefully at the temptation, this is, of course, the temptation. If you partake of this fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you become the source of truth. You don't need God. Because then I become the arbitrator. And so for me, the greatest evil in the church, the greatest danger, the greatest problem is when we choose ourselves as the source of truth, when we choose ourselves above Christ. Now, let me extrapolate that a little bit to the fivefold ministry. Let's put this into context. The gifts that you and I have received and other ministers within the church, we tend to often take those gifts and we find our whole identity and purpose within them. The truth, however, is that those gifts are given and they are temporary. They're not eternal. So for a short period of my existence, I might function as a teacher. There seems to be very little indication that in the world to come, that those gifts continue on. Those gifts are there for the purpose of pointing towards Christ. Christ shall be all. He is ultimately um, the purpose of the consummation. All things coalesce within him. And I think. The danger in the church is when we make ourselves, our thoughts, our ministries, our desires, and our experience the source of truth, even our teachings. And when we start to elevate that above Christ, that's the danger. That's what I struggle with in my own life. And that simply seems to be this daily continuous surrender to the Lordship of Christ. 
Yeah, no, that's deep. And I, I agree. I agree. So, so the challenge would be, because I, because what you're saying is basically is that it is so easy to think, okay, let's say there's an apostle, a prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, somebody with a ministry, maybe it's successful, maybe it's going well, maybe it's not, but it's so easy to think, okay, I've got the answers and I don't really need to listen to other people. I've got, I've got it. You know, my interpretation of scripture, my way of doing things, my methodology, and then you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I I hear you saying we need a, a humility to say, well, I don't have it all. And I really need to learn from others and ultimately from Christ himself. But I think mm-hmm. you said it earlier as well, that Jesus functions through. I mean, every one of the fivefold reveals an aspect of who Jesus is and he ministers through people. And obviously we receive directly from him. So unpack that a little bit for me. What do you, how do you see it? Right. So, so here's the hard part. Compared to God, we are all heretics without fail. I, I what, I simply, what I simply mean by that is none of us have a complete handle on truth. The scripture never says that we as Christians would be the way, the truth, the life. Only Christ. And so it's a question, right, of degrees of heresy. Once you recognize that, once you recognize that truth does not reside in my knowledge or my ability to describe it, it only resides within Christ and within his word, then my orientation, my stance should be one of radical surrender to the Lord. And so an continuous openness to be changed, to be transformed, to receive the truth from Christ himself. So there's a humility that enters in. We have all met those angry theologians, right, that would say, well, I understand it all, and I'm the sheriff of the church, and here I am. And social media, YouTube are fully populated with these folks. And all they do is that they sit and they survey the church and then pronounce judgment on everyone else. Um, It is a very dangerous thing to do. Andre, four years ago, I had a significant transformative experience with the Lord. In the midst, in the midst of a very difficult personal situation that I was going through, I received ministry from an incredible minister who has become my spiritual director. And I remember in the midst of all of this, he had a prophetic word for me. The prophetic word was very painful. And it simply said this. He said, God is saying you are sitting in my seat. You need to get off that seat. And what happened is that I placed myself in a position of judgment towards the church and towards the whole world, not recognizing there's only one throne. And then this minister said, God is inviting you to get up. It was very similar to the experience that Job went through, right? And so when you look at Job, Job goes through a difficult experience, and then he starts to really pontificate. And you read through it, and it's a very painful book to read through all of the complaining and his friends complaining and just a lot of pontificating. But right at the end of the book, God shows up. And and it's fascinating because God actually doesn't answer any of the questions that he asks. All that God does is that he shows him reality, he shows him how big he is. And then he asks him this question, did you do this? Did you create this? Are you able to do this? In essence, putting things into perspective. And then God invited Job to get out of the, get off the throne. And I, and I love how Job ends. He says, he says well, um, twice, I, once I've said, twice I've spoken. And every time I read that, I think, 
Job, that's not entirely true. It's 38 chapters of you speaking. It's not just once I've said, twice I've spoken. And, and then he says, and before I've heard of you, by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you and I put my hand over my mouth. And there's a maturity that comes in ministry and in the gifts when we realize I'm not the source of knowledge, truth, or wisdom. It's only Christ. And the only way that I can serve him and serve the church is if I am surrendered to the way, to the truth, to the life. Not me, but him. I'll add to this. Um, I'm somewhat obsessed with church art. And when you look at the earliest depictions of apostles, it's, it's fascinating how uh, they are pictured. Uh, the apostle Peter is always pictured with red hair. And in the, in the, in the early church mind, um, and red-headed folks, please forgive me for this, the idea is that red-headed folks are a little bit stubborn, right? And then he's got curly a curly beard and curly hair, and it speaks kind of of his stubbornness within it. But John the Baptist universally, universally in art, is always depicted, you know who John is. Well, sometimes he's got like a little locust or a bee on him, you know, that idea of honey and locust. Um, and, and there's a whole prophetic reason, by the way, why he eats honey and locust. But uh, primarily, he's the guy that has got his finger pointed. And if you follow the finger, it always points towards Christ. Sometimes he holds a lamb. And he points, here's the Lamb of God that will take away the sins of the world. The danger in ministry is when we elevate ourselves and the gifts to do what we are wholly unable to do. And so that surrender is of tremendous importance. It's only Christ that is the way, the truth, the life. Yes, yeah, I mean that's that's so good. You know, so for for me, what I've I, I, I love what you're saying. That, you know, when you get off the throne, and I'm sure you know. I mean, your environment, teachers and pastors and preachers in general, are very strong opinionated. You know, we have very strong opinions, and I see with our church leadership. You know, we would talk and challenge one another, but you know, I, I, the the danger is you only like we said previously, like only prophets stick together or only teachers or whatever. And we don't listen to the other side, the other coin, the other aspect of Christ. And mm. I've developed a, a taste for challenge me, you know, bring your part. I know you're carrying something of Jesus in you. You're bringing a revelation from the scriptures. That's different than mine, but it's another aspect of who Jesus is. And and I love that, you know. I love to. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm I feel like I'm growing more, <laughs> but I, I I hear what you're saying. You know, pride hurts. I think sometimes when we as church leaders and Christians in general we get hurt, then we put our defenses on, so we don't want to hear, we don't want to listen to what others are saying, um, and then we miss. We don't hear what the other person is saying. I've seen myself mm -hmm. do that at times. So, Gordon, I want to, the next bit I want to unpack is something that's really concerning me is mm -hmm. the cancel culture in church mm -hmm. amongst believers where we there's a minor theological difference. It's like we agree based on 90 percent. We agree with the Apostles Creed, but there is a 10 percent. There's a something different. And then the result is we demonize one another. We cancel one another publicly. We like. What do we do with that? You know, how do we overcome this? You know, um, so how, how, how do you how do you see that? There's a wonderful theologian by the name of Gavin Auckland, and Gavin has become a really good friend of our school, and he's worked with our faculty. And a while back, Gavin wrote a fantastic book that I can highly recommend on this. It's it's fairly new. I think it's within the last four or five years, and the book is entitled which hill to die on. And the subtitle is The Case for Theological Triage. And what Gavin means by that is that the church has truly suffered from our adoption. I love the phrase that you use, cancel, 
culture. And when you think back about the dimension of cancel culture, what stands at the heart of that is the belief that we have the right to judge others and not only judge, but to separate and critique. And often these are folks that have served very, very little. We live in a world that is so odd and strange because of the internet, because of social media, everybody has a voice. There are no editors in our world anymore. When you think about music right now, I know of at least 20 bands in our church that's putting together music and putting it out. Some of it is great. Some of it is less than great. And you think, Somebody should have told you, right? Somebody should have taken you aside and say, my dear brother, you should not sing that loud in public. Um, or maybe you need to go back and, and learn a little bit more. But the same happens within theology. And I think the problem ultimately is, again, it's in the question of what is the source of truth? Sometimes what we tend to do is that we are tempted to build movements and churches around our interpretation, our pet doctrines, and sometimes we elevate doctrines that are not essential. Here's a bad word. Today, it's a bad word, but actual fact, this word comes from an earlier revival. And it's this word, often when people really don't like you, they will say, well, you are a fundamentalist. That word fundamentalist comes from the turn of the 20th century, where there was a massive evangelical revival. And the question that was asked at that point in time is, what are the fundamentals of faith? What are the non-negotiables? And it's of tremendous importance, Andre, that I think we need to be clear on that, which is, what are the essential, essentials? What are the fundamentals of faith? And then we need to organize our churches and ministries and cooperation around those fundamentals and have charity and openness about the rest. Let me give you a really close to home examples. You and I serve in churches that often have experienced what we would call outpourings or awakenings or revivals. And often those outpourings, awakenings, revivals are demonstrated by a particular manifestation, right? So for instance, People will experience great joy. They will experience laughter. They will experience an exuberance, a lifting of their burdens. And it will be manifested by people maybe feeling overwhelmed physically. Maybe they lie down. Maybe they laugh. Maybe they cry. Those are not bad things. Those are wonderful things if indeed it brings them closer to Christ. However, the moment you take any of those manifestations or human reactions to God's truth, and you make that an essential, and it becomes a dividing line, it becomes an exegetical hermeneutical key to discern God's presence, we have failed. And so this is what happens. We then get used to our services being like that. And then we walk into another community and maybe we don't see those human expressions, those human responses to the glory and the grace and the magnificent freedom in Christ. And then this is what we do. We point to that church and we say, God is not there. The spirit is not there. Let's stop for a moment. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. And by doing that, what we've done is that we've added, we've added to scripture, we've added an additional, um, ungodly, unbiblical dimension to our discernment process of where God is working. And 
at that point in time, we actually start to contradict the scripture. It's, it's a shocking thing that by, by placing or misplacing the essential doctrines, we can deny those very doctrines by doing that. And so I think two things need to happen. I think there needs to be very thorough. I, I'm an advocate for this. I think we need to go back to a catechetical training for the church, catechesis. We need to ask question, what are the essentials of the faith and make sure the church is well trained within those essentials and then teach them to have charity and openness to learn and hear about other possible ways to think about this. I hope that helps. Yes, it helps a lot because I think connected to that would be you know, certain styles, a certain style of worship. Is, oh. It might be different and it's okay. <laughs> you know, but we also Absolutely. tend to like, why are they repeating that one liner of 25 times? That is not yes. of God. Is right. that a valid statement to repeat something? And it's like, oh, that's not God. How do, how do you see the styles? So uh, thank you. Thank you for, for bringing that up, Andre. I think it's very insightful what, what you're saying right now. One of the greatest test cases of this is in worship. And one of the first things that we need to recognize is that all communities have traditions. I know. Lots of churches say, we don't have a liturgy, we don't have traditions, we are just open to the work of the Holy Spirit. We just flow. Folks, if I've been to two services and you start to see a pattern that is a tradition, that is um, in many ways a liturgy. The truth of the matter is that worship is expressed through particular musical and liturgical preferences and cultures. And so worship really often looks radically different in different places in the world. And it looks radically different in the history of the church because culture changes, aesthetics changes, um, musical styles change. And so we always need to be in a process in which we critique not others' worship, but our own. That we ask the question, is this biblical? Is this good? Does this elevate Christ? Now, here's the difficulty. Worship is not about our preferences since we are not the audience. We are not the intended audience for worship, or we are not the ones being adored. This is really difficult and painful because often I've struggled. I uh, serve and worship in a multi ethnic community in America. In, and our church is made up of multiple different ethnic groups, but our worship tends to be urban gospel. Now, Andre, full disclosure here, urban gospel is not my preferred musical taste. I really don't gravitate towards that. My musical taste tends to be more contemplative, and it tends to be a little bit older in musical styles. And I'm not speaking about the 20th century. In actual fact, I think anything past the 15th century is somewhat questionable in music for me. Um, but, but here's the thing. When I am gathered together with my brothers and sisters, the question is not, what's my musical preference? Do I like this style? Do I like this voice? Do I like this particular approach? Do I like a particular progression of chords? The question is, is God being glorified? And am I willing to let go of my own preferences to worship God? It's incredibly dangerous to be in a church where the music just vibes with you, right? Um, because at that point in time, the question again is, who is the audience? I've been in worship services where I've walked out and people have said, well, you know, I give the worship service six out of 10 or nine out of 10. I like this. I don't like that. I really like that new song. That's the wrong way to approach worship. Worship is ultimately about the glorification of God and of Christ. 
And so we need to ask deeper questions of this, and we need to be open to be surprised by others. We also need to be open to be surprised by the Holy Spirit. Um, may I say, um, Andre, I believe that we are standing at the brink of a worldwide renewal of the church. We are starting to see things bubble up absolutely everywhere. And I think that renewal will be marked by two things. I think there will be a creedal renewal, to your point earlier. In a postmodern world where people are overwhelmed with information and myopic, self-interested obsessions with their own knowledge and their own ability to evaluate things, there's a desire for the truth of the gospel, that which is always the same, that which the church has preached at all times in every way, in every place, at all times. That which Jude speaks of, to contend for the faith which was once for all delivered, just once, to the saints. Not constructed, delivered. What is that? But the second, the second part of that renewal, I, I want to use this word, will be liturgical. The concept model of worship has done many good things for us, but it's breaking down. People are at the place that they are overwhelmed and exhausted by our pop music approach. It's too confusing often for people. They don't know who, do, who, are, who are we clapping for? <laughs> um, who, who are we focusing on? And when we have worship bands that are chosen for the way that they look and the way that they sound and the way that they dress and how hip they can be and this and that and the following thing, right? People are longing for something that's more. And one of the things that's happening, we're rediscovering the wisdom of the church. Wisdom of the church. And um, I think we're standing right at the brink of that. The question is, who are we worshiping? Amen. Yes, Elena, we shouldn't worship uh, people or style. We must worship Jesus. So I so resonate with that. That's Absolutely. That's beautiful. So, so Courtney, let's take it one step further. So what, what I'm seeing currently is like, I agree with you that, that we need to focus on the core and have charity with the rest. That's, that's huge. You know, say so if I, if I, I read a little bit of history, you know, a little bit, not a lot, a little bit, but I understand like the reformers, they were brutal when somebody didn't embrace a theological belief, for instance, some of the reformers like embraced uh, the baptism of babies and then the Anabaptists came along and then, and then the reformers said, okay, wonderful. You like to be baptized. Are we going to drown you? We're going to literally drown you in water because you don't agree with my theology and praise God, we're not doing that today, <laughs> but it feels almost like the same spirit. It's just merciless. It is brutal. It is like, we don't agree on this. So you of the devil, you are un biblical you know instead of embracing that charity so maybe unpack that a little bit uh, how you how you see how we how can we become more charitable how can we you yeah. know love one another with the love of god that covers a multitude of sins instead of like what well, we don't agree so you're out then yeah. end of the devil <laughs> andre you're absolutely right in your reading of history there's a long two thousand years of history um, where those that have been strengthened with a particular theological truth during a renewal, a revival, or a reawakening ends up being the ones who persecute the next group that experiences an awakening. When you think of the fact that the Catholic Church burned Christians at the stake for simply having a Bible and reading it. They persecuted the reformers. The reformers persecuted the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists persecuted the pietists. And I can go down the list. This is a common practice. The question is why? What fuels this? I have started a... Um, I have a number of writing projects that I'm involved in, and, and when these are done, um, I'm, I'm working on a monograph 
on the theology of envy. And let me tell you why this is important and how this fits in. I was reading one of the letters um, of a very early church father, Clement of Rome. And let me just situate Clement for a moment. Clement, by the way, interesting enough, speaking about being drowned, um, he died as a martyr and an anchor was put around his neck and he was martyred in the Black Sea. And Clement was a Christian a minister in Rome very early. It is possible that he's a convert of the apostle Peter that went to Rome. That's the proximity within it. So we're speaking around about the 90s, 100s, right, right at the beginning. And it's interesting, today you can go to Rome, it's about three or four blocks from the Colosseum, and you can go back to the church that he started. And today there's a medieval church, but underneath is an earlier church, and right underneath it is the actual home of Clement, where the church met in that home. It's an extraordinary experience. And at that point in time, Clement writes a letter to the church in Corinth, and no surprise here, the same problems that Paul spoke of in Corinth, 40 years later, were still going on. And so they're fighting amongst one another. They're doing exactly the kind of thing that we have said, right? Judging one another, being the sheriffs of the church, tearing one another, being partisan, bringing division, doing all of these things. Incredibly dangerous, terrible thing. Well, Clement really zooms into the problem and he says, what is causing this division in the church? And let me just stop for a moment and say, this is a letter that's 1,900 years old, right? And, and when you read it, it is sobering. We're dealing with exactly the same thing. And he says, what is fueling this? And let me use the exact language of Clement. He says, is demonic envy. And he said, the first murder that occurred is when Cain looked at Abel and his worship. And he envied that. And for that reason, then killed his brother. Clement goes further and he says, envy, spiritual envy, continues to be the destruction of the church. And okay, so maybe we don't kill somebody like the reformers did. Some of the reformers and, you know, um, took the Anabaptists and drowned them. But sometimes we commit character assassination. I'll use an example in the in the city that I live. There's one particular road where there are numerous churches. I've counted more than 60 churches in the same road. Um, the area that I live in is very, very heavily churched, which is a great, marvelous, and wonderful thing. Uh, sometimes I joke and I say we have more churches than cows. And um and and I've had the opportunity to speak in numerous of these churches, and it's fascinating. Andre, to hear what the churches say about one another. Right. Don't go there. Let me tell you what's wrong there. Don't go there. Let me tell you what's wrong there. And what Clement says is what fuels this is the original sin of Satan. The original sin of Satan was not pride, Clement says. And by the way, he's not alone in saying that. He said it's envy. Satan looked at God and said, I want his power. I want what he has. And so often what we do, when we think of ourselves as the source of truth, what we are in essence doing is that we are taking the place of God. We participate in demonic envy. Now, listen to what James says. James says, where there's envy and self-seeking. Now, think about those two things. Often when these divisions occur, they're fueled by a spiritual kind of envy the fear that God might be using this person more than me, right? And self-seeking, the desire for prominence. James says, where there's envy and self-seeking, there is confusion. The Greek term that is used here is more than confusion. It speaks about that original chaos, which the spirit hovered over at the beginning of creation. And every evil spirit. Spiritual envy attracts demons because it's the only power they know, negative power. And so we have to be incredibly careful that we don't participate in that envy. 
But what's the answer to it, right? That's that's the real question today. The answer is a stance of humility. Jesus tried to teach us this, not tried, he did teach us this. When you look at his extraordinary uh, teaching, the new law that he provides in the Sermon on the Mount, the first beatitude says this, blessed, makarios, blessed are the poor in spirit. They get the kingdom of God. And what's poverty of spirit? Poverty of spirit is to recognize what I don't know. And to recognize I am not the way, I'm not the truth, I'm not the life he is. And when there's that stance and that openness and that charity, we are open to receive more. I'll end this section with this. Um, Andre, when we look at our contemporary church worship and liturgy, the majority of the church in history would be uncomfortable with how we do things. And we think what we do is normative. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it is radically different. Up to, literally up to the 17th century, no worship leader faced, not a single one, faced the congregation. Everybody faced the same direction so that nobody would be connected to the worship leader, but the worship leader is a leader in worshiping. You worship. Um, I hope that's yeah, helpful. That is convicting. And when you say about the envy, uh, if I look back at my own past, you know, there were times in our, church, our city, East London in South Africa, uh, I remember the times that when other churches were doing well and they would post everything that's good's happening, I picked up this terrible negativity on the inside of me, you know, and it was tormenting. And so I had to work through that and repent of that and get that ungodliness out to the point of God. I celebrate that church. I celebrate that leader. Lord, I want to serve them. It's not about me. So I so want to agree, you know, we need to get off. We need to get off the throne. We need to get off the throne. Uh, Jesus needs to be enthroned. We're servants. It's not about the size of our church or, or how much praise we get. And if that thing is not dealt with us, mm -hmm. if our hearts are not circumcised, then we partner with evil and we become the persecutors of our brothers, which is just horrific. So, Cornelius, as we end with this session, can you pray for us that God would come and do this uh, in our hearts? Absolutely. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, your only begotten Son, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Alpha and Omega, Prince of Peace. We come to you in the power of your Spirit, who is holy and mighty and renews the face of the earth. And Father, we pray that you would strip from us the choices that we've made. Would you take our hearts and renew it, turn it from stone to flesh? And would you plant within us a deep surrender to your Lordship? Would you help us to lead in repentance and humility and true worship of you? May we cry out with the psalmist, not unto us, not unto us, but to your name give glory. Lord, we pray, may your kingdom come, may your will be done in our lives as it is in heaven. This we pray in the name of Jesus, whom we declare to be our joy, our peace, our hope, our rest, eternal. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Courtney. That was, uh, that was so powerful. Wow. That session cut deep. If you don't feel like you have something to work on or repent of, after that session, then you weren't listening. Envy. We are all vulnerable to this. The enemy is dividing and hurting the church of Jesus Christ because of this. We're divided and missing one another. So let's get rid of envy, of pride and ungodly judgment. Let's have grace for others. May we all be reminded that it's not about us. It's about Christ's glory. May we each get off the throne of God and allow Jesus to take up his place again in our hearts and within the church. If you want to learn more and grow, subscribe to this channel so you can be notified of new interviews. We do an interview every month. So I'll see you in the next video.